So w welcome everybody to the um, lecture number 12 or so of the semester. And um, when you recall what we did last week, we essentially did, ma we essentially did basic number theory, some, some mathematical preliminaries. In particular, you, Euclidean algorithm, extended Euclidean algorithm. Um, and that was the math part. So that was the theoretical background for the fun part. And the fun part comes today. We're going to talk about RSA, which are these three young guys over there. They're not young anymore, OK? But they're in their 50s or so. They're great people. And they invented the most famous, most widely used public key crypto system. So we're going to do that. Uh, and it's a super important lecture because this is essentially what's in your web browser. Okay, it's used all over the world, in particular in the internet. Very, 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 very super important crypto system. Okay. We're going to do three things. We start with an introduction to PK. Whenever you see PK, it means public key or asymmetric cryptography, public key. Um, the two main parts of the lecture, just to warn you, okay? So kind of the, the middle part of the lecture, you have to be awake, which is talking about the RSA crypto system itself, the algorithm. And then this part about, um, is about fast exponentiation, which is an algorithm for implementing RSA. Again, be awake, okay? It's about 60 minutes in the mi middle of the lecture. Towards the end, you can go back to sleep. We're going to talk about the security of RSA. Very important stuff is going to be on the exam, okay? Pay attention, be alert. Okay, so we start with chapter number one. Introduction to public key crypto and Also, very brief introduction to RSA. Um, so what, what, what we want to do, what I want to do first, we look, we want to look at, at the stuff we did so far. That means our current view on cryptography is symmetric cryptography. So if you have a, if you have symmetric algorithms, we want to use them. And right now, we only focus on encryption of data. There are all kind of other things you can do with cryptography. Right now, we're just doing encryption of data. So we have this picture, which you've seen many, many times, and it's getting boring. You have Alice and Bob who want to communicate which, with each other over the unsecured channel. You know, that's the bad internet. Can we be quiet? Hello. You can schlaf. You can go to sleep right now. Just don't talk. Okay, I'll tell you when you have to wake up and don't talk until then. Um, so we have this setup, and we, we've seen that again, we've seen that dozens of times in this lecture. We do an encryption here, and we do a decryption here, and that works fairly well. However, it requires that Alice and Bob share a key. And what is symmetric about the sit setup? Why is that called symmetric cryptography here? What is symmetric about it? Yeah. The same key. The same key, right. And you can, you know, that's the symmetry axis, right? Symmetry axis, axis symmetrisch, right? And, you know, left and right is the same key. It's not very complicated. The big, and, and what is the big practical problem we have before we have the situation? What, what do you have to do before we get the setup? Yeah, distribution of keys. We have to get the keys over, right? So what we need is a secure channel, which is a pain, right? This is, this is painful, right? It's schmerzhaft. This is cost. And you know, in particular, it doesn't work very nice on the internet, right? If you have large networks, the secure channel situation is not pretty, OK? So um, and an analogy, which is not very deep, and I just want to show you a picture from the book, 
an analogy for this type of uh, system is one moment, I just go, uh, we're almost there. It's in our textbook, and it's, uh, most books have that, and I think it's, uh, it's, um, it's somewhat useful. So, what, one way of viewing symmetric cryptography is saying we have a safe, and putting something in, in the safe, you know, one of these lights, right, one of these German file, uh, 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 file sorting things, um, is putting it in the safe, and now Alice, if Ellie want, Alice wants to encrypt, she takes her key, opens the safes, puts something in, locks the safe, right? This is encryption. For decryption, Bob also has the key, the same key, by the way, right? So you take, Bob takes his keys, goes here to the safe, opens the keys, and can decrypt, meaning he can extract the piece of papers, right, the files. So this is a very simple analogy, and this is roughly what's happening. And this was state of the art, you know, starting in ancient Egypt about 4,000 years ago until 1977, at least in the public domain. People thought this is the only way of doing cryptography. And now it's getting interesting. What asymmetric cryptography does, asymmetric algorithms, is based on a, on a the, the very basic operation is, is, is simple and it's a little bit surprising, even though it's very simple, is we, we, ca we can switch to a different model. The, 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 the very basic initial thought of the inventors was, do we really need a key for encrypting something? Because encrypting by itself is not that critical. The thing that is really critical is decryption, right? So now the model for, for public key cryptography is that, let's say, Bob has now two keys, okay? Bob has a private key, which is pretty much what the symmetric keys are about, you know? They keep them to yourself, that's the private key, but you also have a public key, okay? The idea of the public key, we fangen um Viertel nach an, yeah? Und da ist auch eine Treppe. Um, so we, um, the idea of the public keys, and this is a revolutionary thing, that you create a key which you put on your website. So you make a key very, very public, you put it in a phone book, that was the original analogy in the 1970s. So you have a phone book and it doesn't contain your phone number, it contains your crypto key, so everybody can look that up. So clearly you can't use that for decryption. If, you, if somebody gets this key, the person can decrypt. But you all, but it's a public key, so that means that w which is you know in, in, in green with the green box here. So the idea is, you use this public key, and I have my public key, key literally on my website. So you can go there, download the key, and put something in the box, something in the safe. That means this green key, the public key, is only used for the first part, for encryption. So encryption happens from now on with the public key. And for decryption, this is similar to before, only a secret key should be used. And it's not called a secret key, it's called a private key. Okay, so this is a very basic thought. If we are able to do that, we can come up with a simple protocol. I want to draw another picture here. I want to do that a little bit more abstract, but only mildly so. Um, so Bob, and this is a new concept, be awake, has two keys. Before everybody had one key which happened to be the same key. Now, Bob has two keys, a public key, again, this is being put on the website, it's being put in a phone book, whatever, in a registry, and a private key. The public key is being sent to Alice, or often more realistically, Alice actively pulls it from the website, but it's not a secret piece of information. And in particular, you know, bad guy Oscar also has access to the public key. That's the interesting thing. Before, we need a secure channel, you know, as, as soon as Oscar gets hold of the key, he can decrypt and, you know, he won and Alice and Bob lost. This time, this is the interesting thing. Oscar can read the public key and it's of no use to them, hopefully. So what happens then, now if Alice wants to do in, um, encrypt something, Alice use the encryption function, she encrypts her message X, and 
file, email, hard disk, whatever, piece of music, using the public key, okay? So that's the green key, that's the green boxes in the drawing. Alice sends the ciphertext over it, as before, over the unsecured channel. Of course, Oscar, you know, Oscar can observe this, Oscar can observe that and read. And on the receiving side, for decryption, Oscar uses, of course, the ciphertext, and now, but he decrypts with the other part of the key, which is, has to be very secret, has to be kept secret. Okay, that's it. This is public key cryptography in five minutes. Okay, that's the basic idea. And now the big question, obviously, are what is E? What is D, right? What is the encryption and decryption function? And one very pretty solution to that is RSA, the RSA public key crypto system, which has become the most important public key crypto system. And that's what we're going to do today. Some facts about some facts about RSA, and it's just very, very simple. So that was invented in 1977 by Ron Rivest, Adi Shamir, and Leonard Edelman. And that's where the name stems from, RSA, okay? The invention was triggered indirectly by a paper from 1976 by Diffie Hellman, and they are also, they are kind of the real inventors of public key cryptography together with Ralph Merkel. So they, they were triggered, the, some of the ideas came from um, the paper by um, Diffie and Hellman, and we're going to talk about that either next week or after the, after the, uh, um, break, but this is kind of the, the two very important papers that started the field of public key cryptography, and that's kind of the second one. The first paper was a year early, and we're going to talk about that um, again in the next few weeks. Um, one thing, which, one fact which I mentioned a few times is the most popular public key, is an abbreviation again, most popular public key crypto system. The nice thing, and I'm going to, once we start about Diffie Hellman, I'm going to talk more about this. The nice thing about public key cryptography, that means way of realizing this, you know, this type of setup, um, there are only three, essentially three families of public key crypto system, which is great. Unlike symmetric key cryptography, we did DS here and we did AES here. In reality, there are a few hundreds of these, for instance, block ciphers, and they are probably 100 stream ciphers or so. There's a few hundred symmetric key algorithms. There's no way we can ever do them in a lecture. In the public key case, it's much easier. There's essentially three, essentially three types of crypto system with practical relevance, I should say. So out in the wild, you know, in the real world, there are only three types of algorithms being used. There's RSA, there's discrete logarithm system, whatever that is, um, and elliptic curve cryptography, and we're going to do all three together. Okay, this is number one is RSA, and then comes discrete logarithm. We need two or three weeks for that, and then come elliptic curve, and again, we need another one or two weeks with that. And by the end of, around end of May, you will know all public key crypto system that, is, that there is to know for use in practice. There are a whole bunch of other more exotic crypto system, public key crypto system, but in practicality, there are only three, and again, we're going to do the first one today. It's very important. Um, I don't have hard numbers, but my guess is the market share, you know, in, in counted by the number of, of implementations that are being used. Again, there are only three. RSA is the biggest one. I don't have numbers. My guess is maybe 70%. Maybe 70% of implementation or 80% use RSA, 
and then there's another 20 or 30 percent is being used by the discrete logarithm system. Maybe I'm off here, but it's, that, that is my, my guess, okay? Um, RSA had some, a little bit of problems being really widely used because it uh, uh, used to be patented, but only in the US, USA, but it expired a while ago until the year 2000. This is just a little bit of a real world uh, uh, fact. Okay, so this was the wa warm up. Now we come and we, we're done with the first part of the lecture. The first 20 minutes weren't that bad, right? It's essentially this here, and again, looking at this block diagram, it's a simple protocol. Now, we, we want to come up with function E and D that encrypts with a public key and decrypts with a private key, okay? And of course, the challenge is maybe a little bit jumping ahead. We want to encrypt using a public key, which is known by Oscar, yet Oscar cannot be able to do this decryption. This is, of course, the hard part, right? doing some data scrambling, you know, everybody can do that in using a key, but now Bob must be able with the right key to decrypt, and Oscar is not able to do that. That's the hard part. So we start the second chapter, which I call the RSA. Algorithm. Okay, and we have two subchapters, two sections. One is called 2.1, where we talk about the key generation. And I just want to write this, uh, 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 a sentence down. Unlike symmetric algorithms, and in parentheses, AS, triple des, or whatever, um, comma, public key algorithms require the computation of the pair ka public comma ka private okay the interesting thing here is obviously we need a k public k, k private this may be somewhat of an uh, maybe the most important word in the sentence is computation they have to be computed, unlike AS or DAS, probably you don't want to compute the secret key, you want to have something, a true random number generator. Here is math involved and pretty hefty math that you will see. That's why we have this, you know, subsection key generation. In RSA it's doable, but to give you an idea, for instance, to come up with these keys or the parameters, for instance, with elliptic curves, it's sometimes you need a few hours of computation to generate good elliptic curves. Okay, it's not as bad in RSA, but this is, sim this is essentially a step that is missing in, in, in symmetric ciphers. If you do AS, there is not really a complicated involved scheme to uh, compute keys. Okay, so now we do that, I think, on the next board. We need a little bit of space. Now just give you, give you the, uh, um, a five-step approach to computing the uh, uh, parameters. The first thing what you do is, so this is now key generation, okay? Choose large primes, and they're almost always called P and Q in the literature. I guess P for prime and then Q because it's the next letter in the alphabet, okay? It's not very... You could, you could have probably called it P1, P2, they're always called P and Q. And 
This next step is you take the two primes and you multiply them. This is not very complicated. And the product, again, is almost always in the literature called n, okay, which is maybe the most important parameter in RSA. Okay, that's the mod is, and it, it, it ends up being the modulus. Now we need something which was very strange until seven days ago, which is the Euler's phi function, phi of n. I talked a little bit about that. And it turned out it's really easy to compute phi of n under which condition? What do we have to know about n in order to compute that quickly? Yeah, we need it. Yeah, with the product of prime, we, exactly. Product of prime, we need to, uh, the fancy way of, of putting that is saying we need the prime factorization. If you have an integer, if you know the primes, you know that uh, out of which the integer is composed, it's really easy to do. And there was this uppercase pi, and it's called the p symbol, this product symbol. And it turns out for this special case of product of two primes, it's p minus one times q minus one. You remember there was one homework problem for that, right? Now this is why we did it. Okay, it's really useful. Okay, so this was all warm up, right? It was a part of the warm up phase. Now we really talk about generating the keys, right? Now we haven't generated any keys. The first key is the public key. This is almost always in the literature denoted by the by a lowercase e, kleines e, okay? E for encryption. Why e for encryption? Because at this point, the public key actually does the encryption. That's why you use an e here. And surprise, surprise, the private key will be called d for decryption, okay? So. Oops, wrong board, okay. Again, you can choose it, and it's also, this is very different from symmetric key cryptography. In symmetric key cryptography, all keys must be random. Essentially, you have to do, you know, you have to use an, an uh, euro coin and, you know, do coin tossing, right, to generate 128 random bits. This is just choosing. It doesn't say choose randomly, choose. It doesn't have to be particular secret, okay? It doesn't have to be secret at all. It has to come from a certain set, of course, namely from the set 1, 2, up to phi of n minus 1. And remember, phi of n, computing phi of n is not very difficult. S dot T dot bedeutet means such that, so does. That means with the, with the following uh, uh, additional condition, the GCD of E and phi of N must be one, okay? Another way of putting that is saying E, that means the public key and phi of N are relatively prime. Okay. We talked about this condition a few, a couple of times in this in this course already. Does anyone know if, if this condition is fulfi fulfilled? Which value exists then? Do you know? Do you, do you know? The, inverse. the inverse, exactly. So the inverse, and you know, you see, e is smaller as the, of of this, so it's probably the inverse of e. And it turns out the inverse of E is the private key. That's it, okay? Computing inverses is something very, very important. You have some essential, you know, a freely chosen parameter. If you compute the inverse, that's the private key, okay? So now we have to do that. So we compute car private, and we call that D. I mentioned that before. comma, such that, so does, the condition is d times e must be equal to 1. And now pay, I just warn you, because this is a beautiful thing to make, to make mistakes here. 
modulo phi of n. Okay, and I'll tell you in a second why this is easy to make mistakes. So for the key generation, we do arithmetic modulo phi of n. That means the two keys are the inverses of each other modulo phi of n. You say, why is it easy to make mistakes? Because you will see in five minutes, the actually doing encryption and, and decryption, doing actually RSA is always modulo n. Okay? Normally, kind of your brain will get used to, if I see RSA, I compute modulo n, except in the key generation phase, which you only do in the beginning of RSA, there's one, at, one, at, at one point you have to compute stuff modulo phi of n, okay, just to warn you. So that's it. There are five steps here. And we, I guess we put that in a, can put a frame around that, box that in. This is very, very important. Um, and it seems, they, they seem quite random, right? Quite arbitrary, zufällig, willkürlich gewählt. This set of five steps is going to be very important. If you finish studying here, this will come up over and over and over again. They're super important steps in, in modern cryptography, okay? And if you, you know, do enough example at some point, they will be, become part of your general knowledge or uh, whatever belt builds, right? So um, now at the end of the step, the main thing we get out here is the public key, and it was a little bit, E is only part of it, and probably the main part of the public key, but strictly speaking, the public key has two parts, namely this value E, but also this product N here, okay? What you get also out is one parameter for the private key, which is this value D. Okay, so I just want to put a few remarks down here, right next to the box here. So if you have, if you have you know, space on, in, in, in your notebook, you know, write it on the right hand side. So um, here I said, Choose large primes, and large is kind of a very soft adjective, right? What do we mean large? Well, we mean really, really large. Namely, in practice, P and Q nowadays should be have at least 512 bits. Very, very often you want to get twice the length. That means P and Q, each of them are 1024 bits, about 300 decimal digits. That means If P and Q have 512 bits, does anyone know how big the product is N here? This has 512 bits, this has 512 bits. Anyone know? Anyone good? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You add them up, 1024 bits. So this becomes, okay. And again, today, for reasons that we, if we have time, we discuss towards the end of the class, you need twice that, okay? You need, you need 2048 bits. Things get get long and, and, and slow if you implement it in software. Um, phi of n is b easy, this is easy, and maybe the last remark here. So here you just choose something, this is multiplication, we don't have to talk about that. Um, how, do we compute, how do we compute the inverse? What is our favorite algorithm? Yeah, very good. Extended. Euclidean algorithm, okay? See last week, compare last week, okay? Compare homeworks that you did last night or this morning, right? This is why we did that, why we forced you to do that, okay? Okay, so this is, you know, the first step is 2.1 key generation and, yeah. Yeah, he's good. Very often in practice, you know, let's say with PGP, you can choose the key length. They say, use RSA 1024, a very good question. Is that this 1024 here or here? It's here. You always talk about N. This N kind of gives you the security parameter. The, the, the longer, the more secure. So it's not very complicated, this thing. 
If, we, if people say we want to have RSA with at least 1024 bits, they mean n 1024 bits, you divide that number by 2, you get the length of the two primes here. Okay. Good. So now we're done with the key setup. So we haven't done any actual encryption, right? So if in, in, the, uh, in this very simplistic block diagram, we're done with this step here, right? Okay, in particular, what we have not done is we haven't addressed the question marks, the Fragezeichen here, right? How do we do encryption? How do we do decryption? And this is going to be the next section, which actually fits in here. Two point two is um, RSA encryption. and decryption. The nice thing about RSA is this, this is kind of a little bit involved and very arbitrary looking. Now the beauty of RSA is conceptually this is super easy. This is one very simple, one operation, very simple operation that does encryption and then another very simple, now I'm here, another very simple operation that has decryption. It's very simple. Okay, so encryption works as follows, given what is given, the public key consisting of n, which is called the modulus, and you will, in, 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 in 60 seconds you will know why, why n is called the modulus, given ka public consisting of n and e, and a message, you know, we encrypt a message, and the message now has restriction. It must come from a certain set, namely from um, in Zn or Zn. Consisting of the numbers 0 up to n minus 1. Okay. And now the actual encryption computes the ciphertext Y and this is our standard notation we, we used for, you know, since the beginning of this course. And now comes, be awake, now comes the big RSA formula which is laughably easy. You simply do an exponentiation. That's the whole encryption. You do an exponentiation, c'est ça. Okay, we're done. And everything modulo n. This is red frame number two, roter Kasten number two for today. And there's much to say about that here, at least for now. There will be much more to say, but for now there isn't much. I mean, at least conceptually, it's pretty easy, right? You take x. You take E, which we computed here, somewhere, here. And you take it modulo N, which we computed here. So once you're done with this, you know, which is a little painful to do that, the actual encryption is, seems, seems pretty easy. Um, so this is what Alice does in our example. The right-hand side does the encryption. You send stuff, oh, the left-hand side, sorry. <laughs> and this is your right-hand side. Now you decrypt, so Bob, on, on, upon receiving the message, Bob has to decrypt. That means Bob, given Y, Bob would like to recover X. How do, wh what do we do? It's, it's very similar to before. What's given now is car private, which is this parameter D, and Y, which is the ciphertext, which is of course, if you do modulo n operation, you get a result in the range 0, 1, 2, 3, up to n minus 1. So y is again in this ring uh, Zn. And what we do, x is the decrypted version of y using the private key. Again, our standard notation holds. And this is equivalent to y 
And again, you do an exponentiation just with a different exponent, namely the private key. Y raised to the dth power mod n, and that's it again. Okay. So this was a lot of formula, many more formulas than we used to without, you know, major motivation. I would, would like to do at this point, I would like to give you an example, which we, yeah. Yeah, so he summarized, you know, chapter number four we want to do today. RSA security is excellent. He's much too smart. You can go home now. So for the rest of the day, uh, so he um, he said the whole security relies on beruht auf hängt dran hinges on the fact that um, yeah I, I can tell you that now at this point. So Oscar would like to do the same, right? Obviously, Oscar sees why the ciphertext he would like to decrypt. So what do you have to do? What is the one information Oscar does not have? Which is the one parameter he, he would like to have? Yeah, which is D, right? He doesn't know D. How, how, how do we compute D? Well, D is here, extended Euclidean algorithm, right? You know, he, he watches the video, he buys my book, he knows how to do that, right? He goes to Wikipedia, right? It's cheaper, so he goes to Wikipedia. He knows how to do that. But what is the problem? Why can he not compute D? Why? He is Oscar. What, what, what is the problem for Oscar? He knows the Euclidean algorithm, he was in my lecture, he knows E, what is the thing that, that, that what's the problem for him? Yeah. C of n. Well, C of n can be computed, right? There was this formula, it's really fast, Professor Parr said. Yeah, the formula is here, but the formula is only fast if, if you know P and Q, okay. It turns out, if I give you 1,024-bit numbers, it's about 300 decimal digits, so 300 decimal stellen. If I give you a 300-digit number, you cannot factor that. Nobody in the world can factor that. It's very hard. The factoring record is 650 bits or so. We cannot do 1,024. We definitely cannot do 2,000 bits, okay? So this is factoring. With factoring, thinks it's, it's easy for Oscar to, to uh, uh, attack the system. Once he's factored, he can compute phi of n. He knows E anyway, that's a public key. He knows phi of n and he computes that. This, this is why modern public key cryptography and factoring are really closely related. Excellent remark. I'm jumping ahead with this lecture, but it's, it's fine. Um, so now I want to do an example. Example for what? I want to rebuild this protocol here, right? So we have our friend Alice, we have our friend Bob. So now we do, this is cookbooks, this is boring, this is almost, you know, not worth to do at a university, we do it anyway. We do cookbook, we do step one, two, three, four, five, with small numbers, not with 1024-bit numbers. So Bob starts with step one, you know, choose P and Q, and we choose two very small numbers. P is three, Q is 11, okay, so we can do most of the arithmetic we can do by hand. Number two of, in our recipe book is compute the product and peak times Q, which is 33. Step number three of the key generation uh, uh, protocol is computing phi of n, which is P minus one is, the, can anybody do that in mentally without supercomputer? It's 20, right? 3 minus 1 is 2, 11 minus uh, 1 is 10, so it's 10 times, 2 times 10, sorry, is 20. 
So we're done with step number three. Step, no step number four is choosing a public key, and I choose a small public key here. Okay. I choose e equals to three, which is really bad as an example. I'll do it anyway. Because this is equal to this one prime number, it's just there aren't that many small numbers, okay? E, e doesn't have to be equal to P, right? This is a big coincidence. RSA works anyway. So um, it's, I tried pretty hard to come up with a good example for RSA. It's not that easy. I, I would like to have an example where you can do everything by mental arithmetic, by Kopfrechnen, right? It works so la la. There's one point at, you know, in, in, in two minutes where it's getting a little hard. Um, step number five. Oh yeah, by the way, is this GCD condition fulfilled? Is E and phi of n, is, are they relatively prime? What's the GCD of 20 and 3? That's one, right? It's fine. So that's, that's part of the problem. You, could, you can try 4, but then 4 is not relatively prime, and 5 is not relatively prime, 6 is it's only 7, and then the numbers become big. So that's why I chose 3. Um, now we have to compute D. D is the inverse of one, uh, 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 inverse of three, which turns out to be actually seven. Modulo phi of n modulo 20. Just a little. Let's see whether we're doing the right thing here. D times E is seven times three. What is 7 times 3 modulo 20? It's 1. And that's the GCD condition, right? It's where is that? Yeah. We, it's, the example is fine. I'm not, I'm not lying to you. OK. So now we're done with the setup phase. Let's look at the protocol. What does the protocol tell, the, tell us to do? Come on, the billigen Plätzen, da. Yeah, see, ruhig. We send the public key over at this point here. Okay, it's the first part of the doing the actual crypto stuff. Let's do that. So we send over car public, which consists of the modulus n, which is the 33, and the public parameter e, which is 3. Okay. Now we're here in the protocol. Let's jump to the next step is we actually want to do encryption. So let's do LSE encryption. And what is the encryption function? What is the question mark? Well, the question mark got answered in form of this red box here. This is what Alice has to do. What I assumed a message x with the value 4. OK, not very sophisticated. Um, now Alice encrypts. What does she do? Well, she takes a message. Message four raises that to the eth power to this here. This is n comma e. Raise it this to the power e, right? Hoch e nehmen, and e is three. Anybody really good? Four times four times four. Any? It's very good. Sixty-four. And now you have to reduce modulo, namely modulo with n modulo 33. Can anyone do that without calculator? 64 modulo 33. What is that mod 33? This is 31. Very good. Okay. So now what? Going back to the protocol. Once we computed the ciphertext, it's a nice thing about the ciphertext. It's encrypted, so we can send that over the internet. Means we can put that on the channel. We send Y over. On the receiving side, Bob has to decrypt. And how does this work? Well, this was the this framed box here, this framed formula. Again, take the ciphertext, raise it to the private key's power. That means this is. Hopefully, this is becoming x, right? x is computed as taking the ciphertext, 
to the d's power, which is 31 to raised to the seventh. And this is this one point in time where it's hard to do mental arithmetic. I'm going to give you a point in a second how to do that anyway. This turns out to be 4. You know, this is my funny notation here. You know, this is an exclamation mark, Ausrufezeichen, right? This is my invention, right? It's actually the invention of my math professor when I was in second semester. Um, and why is that a great thing? Because this is the same thing we had at this point. Okay? Modulo, again, modulo n, and n was 33. Okay, so after decryption here, we develop that. So the one frustrating thing is that here you, uh, you, you need a pocket calculator here, right? And now I'm going to show you a little cute trick related to modular arithmetic, which has nothing to do with RSA. And if you hate mental arithmetic, if you hate Kopfrechnen, you can sleep for two minutes, okay? If you like Kopfrechnen, modular arithmetic, you can be awake. I want to show you a quick way of doing that. Again, this has nothing to do with RSA. It's off topic, outside the lecture. You know, switch your laptop on, watch YouTube or whatever, right? That's fine. Um, so I want to do... Of course, you can do long num. You, you can actually do, you know, arithmetic by hand and schoolbook multiplication. This, this is a very neat trick, namely... 31 is pretty close to 33, right? And what happens if you replace 31 by a negative number modulo 33? Which one is that? Does anyone know? It's equal to minus 2, so this is... It's an, you remember we did this equal, equivalence class, equivalence class and stuff in, since the second lecture? You can do that. Mathematically, 31 is the same as minus 2, if you do mod 33 arithmetic. The nice thing is 2 is a much smaller number than 31, right? I think I ask you at some point, please memorize, auswendig lernen, memorize the powers of 2, right? 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, 1024. Just remember them. If, if you're lying awake at night, if you wake up too early, if you wake up in the night, go through your head the first 10 powers. It's really useful at this point in time because, because I'm doing that always when I wake up early. This is 128. Okay, so I can do this exponentiation pretty quickly. Mod 33. And now things become pretty easy. Because this is now... Four times thirty-three is hundred twenty. What? Hundred thirty-two. What am I doing wrong here? <laughs> I'm doing something wrong here. Um, das ist hundert zweiunddreißig. Dann kommt der Mi. Ah, ich nicht. Es ist minus four times. This is minus 132, right? And what, what, what is the correction term I need at this point here? Are you really, anybody really good with Kopfrechnen here? It's four. Okay. So now, I'm going to take this mod 33, and this, this becomes zero, right? So. I didn't need a pocket calculator. That's the thing. Back to RSA, so this is, this was intermezzo here, right? Okay, this is just to show you even this seemingly complicated operation, if you're creative and you know your modular arithmetic rules, you can do in your head, right? Okay. Um, so what is now missing with RSA is um, uh, 
two remarks. Okay. One thing which is really important, I mean, we're not going to do due to time reasons here, is to prove that decryption and encryption are actually inverse operations. I show, you know, in this case of the example, it In the case of the example, it worked, which was a little strange. Maybe I should have mentioned that before. I take my x value, my message, raise it to the power, and I get some value, 31. I take it 31, I raise it to the different power, I get the original value out. There's a little strange thing that's happening here. It's not very intuitive. It's not there intuitive, gefühlsmäßig. This is not what I expect. I do one exponentiation, I do a second exponentiation, and they cancel out. I get the original value again, right? So in order to show that this always works, if I do x to the e, and then I do the result raised to the d, if this condition holds, this is a condition on the exponents, right? d and e must be the inverses of each other mod phi of n. They must be inverses of each other mod phi of n. This is what's called the proof of correctness, and we're going to do that in, in the help session, in the Übung, right? <laughs> but I just want to write that down. Proof of correctness this is in the Übung, and if you can't wait till Monday, um, or page 178 of, in, in, in the textbook as the first remark. Second is, we just saw an example. In the real world, and I mentioned that before, real world, RSA parameters, parameters, are very large compare page 177 in the textbook and I think yeah I'll show you that I think it's, it's I just brought them down we just put that in the book I think it's kind of good to have you know if you see them once in your life time if you see how so this is how RSA looks in practice. You get pretty long on, okay? This P, Q, N, E, and D is a real world example. Jan, you know, with whom I wrote the book, Jan Pels computed them, okay? So this is the numbers you're dealing with. I didn't want to use them on the blackboard. You know why, right? So this is, okay, but this is just to get a feeling things are really, really long, okay? Also maybe one remark. There is, to my knowledge, there is no other, hello, there is no other technical application, so there's no other technical anwendung where you have to deal with such long numbers. You know, if you, if you have a fancy cell phone, this German professor have, right, this, there's all kind of multimedia stuff happening here, you know, data compression, you can watch videos, there's a lot of stuff happening there in, in terms of algorithms, you know, there's this, there's a communication algorithms to, to establish the link, right? All kind of stuff, they're very complicated. All of that stuff, it's not easy to do that, right? None of all the algorithms, data compression, uh, 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 doing error correction stuff, needs arithmetic with such long numbers. So this is something that is unique to modern cryptography, okay? Just, this is just Allgemeinbildung, right? So you know, crypt, the, the, this long number stuff, never happens in any other applications. This is only public key crypto, okay? Okay, so um, that was number two of today's lecture. And this was the first very super important part is doing RSA. Now you know what RSA is and you can get, you know, you know how we operate, so you're going to get homework assignments and you have to compute 500 of these examples by hand with a pocket calculator, right? So, you know, 
it gets imprinted, eingeprägt in your brain, right? We really, we really want you to, to, uh, to hate these three red boxes, right? And a good wing of hating is, you know, just do that 50 times, right? I'm exaggerating, but you, this is a basic idea. Um, yeah, I mentioned that, right? This is this Zen, right? Zen thing. Zen Buddhism, they say if you want to do things really well, you have to do them 30,000 times. We, you know, 20 times is enough for us, but I think it's, it, it's, it's a good metaphor, right? You, the more you do things, the better you get, and even you, you hate Päckchen Rechen, right? That's why they do Päckchen Rechen in, in the Grundschule, right? Kleines einmal eins, right? You do that essentially two years, right? If this my third kid is just in second, in third grade. You do for two years, you just do kleines einmal eins, it's because you become better and better and it's really useful in life. It's a little bit with RSA, the more of the stupid examples you compute, the more of a feeling you get. So, now comes, I think for me personally as a teacher, and I'm in a different position than you are, I think that's the fun part of today, is doing fast exponentiation, okay? Now, if you want to implement, and, and this has to do, it has nothing to do with the algorithm, with the mathematics per se, or why the algorithm works, but if you look at these numbers, and they are in, in hexadecimal notation, it would almost be better to show them in binary with zeros and ones, and we actually would have 1024 bit long numbers, right? A, P and Q would be 500 bits, but N, D and E would be 1024 bits. So what I want to talk about now is the practical side of R, say. And what I want to focus on is not so much this here, because this can be done on, uh, this is actually what, what is hard in practical term is generating two large primes, and maybe we, we do that in the, in the Übung, in the help session. But there's one thing which is very important, it's so important that I want to do that with you here, and I think it's really, really fun. I, I love that, the, the next topic. Namely, in practice, your web browser, Every, every time you want to encrypt your credit card number, if you buy something at, at Amazon or, or eBay or whatever, you don't have to do that every time. Why? Because this is setup time. And normally you set up your RSA parameter once and that's it till the end of the lifetime of your smart card, for instance. If you, if you have a smart card with RSA on board, this is being done literally in the factory when the, R, when, when the smart card is manufactured, more or less. But you do that only once, you know, D, E, and N are being burned on, on, your, on, your, on your Geldkarte. It's not on the Geldkarte, but whatever. And, you know, there are bank cards that have RSA. It's being put on the Geldkarte. That's it. That means we don't have to worry about the red box anymore. But now, every time you encrypt stuff on the Internet, every time you establish a secure session to Amazon, you have to do this stuff. So what, I, what, what I'm trying to motivate here is, it's pretty important that we do this reasonably well. So the question is now in the third chapter of today is, how do we do this fast and this fast, and they're both exponentiation. So now we want to talk about fast exponentiation. And now I want to look how to implement. Implementieren heißt bauen, yeah. Yeah, it's try and error, and it's even, wor even worse. In practice, there are few E values that are very, very popular, in particular small E values, okay? And one value that is popular is 17. Okay. Yeah. And 17, <laughs> yeah. It's, it, it's pretty unlikely that, this, uh, that one of those, just in terms of likelihood, that one of those has P minus Q or Q minus 1, as, as 17 as a prime factor, and that this is fulfilled. Of course, you have to check that. But the thing, uh, the other, wing, other thing is you, you choose something random and you check here. It's, it's not that hard to find one. In most cases, just you, you pick one and that's it. Okay? It's a good question, but it's not hard. It's not hard. Hard is finding P and Q, and, but again, this is not something I want to do today here. So what I want to do is fast exponentiation. That means implementing. If I want to implement here and has bauen, right? I, I want to build this here. How do I do that? And actually, I want to split that in three, in two, two uh, uh, sub, sub topics, subsection. I want to do 
an introduction, so general Again, the motivation is that we have the following problem. In practice, we have to compute x to the e for encryption, and we have to compute y to the d, both mod n. This is encryption, this is decryption. You don't have to copy that, it's here, right? Just to make you know, nice notes for your, for your notebook. And exponentiation per se isn't that bad. We know how to do exponentiation. Unfortunately, we have to do exponentiation with those numbers, with really absurdly large numbers. So with very long numbers. And this is the, you know, the topic of Chapter number three of today, how, how do we do that quickly, okay? And let's start with a few preliminaries, so some general thoughts. How, how do we do exponentiation? So we do an example. Uh, where do we do that? That might work here. Let's start simple, x to the fourth, okay? How do we compute that? So the naive way of computing that is computing x times x is x squared, x squared times x is x cubed, x of 3, and x cubed times x is x to the 4. Right, of course, right, of course should be a reaction. What else should we do? And what are the costs here? Eins, zwei, drei, three multiplications, okay? So now, oh by the way, wake up. This is next 10 minutes, very important. You, you don't want to learn that from the book, what I'm going to show you here, please, okay? The first question, and this is a question you should take very serious. Are there any ways of doing that less than, with less than three multiplications? And don't look in the book, because then it's easier. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So that's the naive way, and this is, I call that better way, okay? The better way does, of course, you have to, when you start with x, the only thing you can do is compute x times x. I guess you can compute a square root or something crazy, but this is the only reasonable way. And now, your colleague, your commilitone, just said so exactly the right thing. Why multiplying with x? Why don't we take this x square, this larger value, and multiply that by itself? And this gives us two multiplications. Great, right, you say this, this is really, ooh. it's not, right? It doesn't seem barely worth it. But in practice, we're not doing x to the fourth, we do x to the, you know, really bad, right? So really long numbers. So let's look at another example. We want to compute x to the eighth. Again, we start with the naive way, which is a very polite way of saying the stupid way, right? We just do this very stupid thing. We can only multiply by x. So we do x by x is x squared. x squared times x is x cubed, x of 3. And at the end, you do x to the 7th times x is x to the 8. And this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Multiplication, and then we had this really cool trick here, right? Instead of multiplying by x again, we multiply by x squared. Let's see how that works in this case. We do x times x is x squared. x times x is x to the fourth. What should we do next? Yeah? Exactly. Multiply x by the, to the power of 4 by itself, x to the 8. 
Why am I doing that? Because maybe here we saved one multiplication. Here it's getting a little bit more interesting. We reduce, you know, we save more than 50% of the workload, okay? Now in practice, eight is not a particularly impressively large number, right? These are four bits. Again, you, we have 1024 in practice, right? So the, just to give you a feeling, so how do we deal with this number? How do we deal with, okay? Again, the naive way, this homework assignment, okay, so. <laughs> How many multiplications? Whoever says 1024, I'm, I'm going to kick out of this university, right? It's not 1024, but yeah, yeah. So this is two to the 1024, and if you exact, right, it's always minus one here, right? We had the problem is, even if I had a lot of time, means more time, you know, the end of the universe, I would run out of chalk, out of kaida, right? You know, I ask it, right? I think there are about two to the 200 or two to the 300 atoms, atome, in the known universe. So they're not enough atoms for, for Kaido, right? I, I, I cannot write that down, even if I get really, really old, right? And the sun cools down everything. This will never, ever, ever, ever work, okay? Two to the 1024 is a really bad number. So how far are we, and this is, uh, this is too unfortunate, right? Uh, can I squeeze it in? So please write that down on the left hand side. The better way of doing is, is starts with x times x is x squared, x squared times x squared is x to the fourth, blah, 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 blah. It would take, it would take me two hours, probably, or three hours, I could do it, and there's still, there's enough chalk in this box to do that, right? I, I don't need two to the 300 atoms for doing that. That's what I'm trying to say. At the very end of my letter here, I end up with x to the 1,023 times x2 to the 1,023, which gives me x to the 2 to the 1,024. Everybody with me? How many steps do I have here? Can anyone see that? This, you just look at the exponent, right? This is to the zero, to the one, two to the two, two to the three, two to the, two to the four. It's 1,024. So this is 1,024 multiplications. So and and and, and what, what do you prefer? You know, lifetime of the universe versus 1,024. 1024 is, is better for our web browser, right? So this, so this is a great, great example for, this is, this is linear complexity, linear in the exponent. The exponent is two to the 1024, and this is logarithmic, logarithmic. complexity. So, so this is really great what Professor Pa showed us. Unfortunately, what is the problem with this ne really neat trick? Why can't we, does this work with the num, with this E number there? Does this work? No, why not? W what is the restriction on this great trick here? I, w w what do example one, two, and three have in common here? Was ist gemeinsam bei den drei Beispielen hier? Ja. Exponent is even, it's more than even, it's. Ja. Yeah. Exponent is a power of two. These are super special cases, right? They're all, this is, vier is in zweier Potenz, is a power of two, eight is a zweier Potenz, and two to the is a zweier Potenz. In this case, I have a really fast algorithm. These are super, super rare, those numbers. 
I would like to have something for arbitrary numbers. And now the cool stuff parts. Now I'm going to show you a way of doing that. It's roughly as fast as this trick. It works for all the numbers. And it's really cool. And probably nobody of you knows that. This is not something we deal with in everyday life. And I, I love that algorithm. This is a square and multiply algorithm. I guess I shouldn't do that. So I start handing out these um, Bögen evaluation sheets. Please do not start filling them. I'm st I'm, I promise I stop five minutes early today. Do it then. I just want to hand them out now, OK? Don't look at them. Take one, OK? This is the cool stuff, and it's bad timing what I'm doing here, right? I just. So coming back to the square and multiply algorithm. Other names for this method. It's the binary method, which is a name I don't think is that great, or left to right exponentiation, which is a name that I do like, but I prefer square and multiply. Okay? And again, this is the thing, please. But can you be quiet? Just just watch. It's re it loans sich absolut. Nächsten zehn Minuten, don't do that with a book. It's Sunday afternoon, zwei Stunden, if you do that yourself. Maybe 90 minutes, okay? But this is five minutes with me, everybody's happy, okay? So we start with an example, and again, we, we saw for the special cases that the exponent is a power of two, zweierpotenz, it works. Now what happens if it's not a power of two? And we start with an, um, I should do that here, OK. Example, I want to compute x to the 26, OK? And first, I show you how it works, OK, we, without giving the algorithm. And then we look, what, 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 is the, what are the rules behind that? Again, when you start with x, the first thing you can do, you can square. It's pretty much the only, only sensible thing to do. Then I multiply by x. I get x cubed, x to the third, x to the power 3. OK, x hoch 3. Now I multiply x by itself. I square. I get x to the sixth. Now I multiply x, this result, by itself again. It turns into x to the 12th. I multiply, I compute x times x to the 12th is x to the 13th. And at the end, I square again. Somehow it works. It's not that bad, right? Again, remember the naive way, the stupid way, it would have been x always multiplying by x, and it would be 25 iterations, OK? So here, I'm getting away with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 operations. And now let's look a little bit more detailed. What are the operations? I start here with the squaring. Right, this is squaring. Here is, I call this multiply, multiplying by x. Here I square. This is the squaring again. In this iteration, I multiply it by x, so I call this multiplying by x, I just call multiplication. And at the end, I square again. So if you ask me, Please, Professor Pa, how can I compute x to the 26 quickly? My answer will be 
square multiply square square multiply square and voila the result is correct right Are you with me so what we what, what we need to know is what is the right sequence i mean if if you if you replace this by squaring you get the incorrect result everybody with me so what, what we would like to know is what is the systematic way when do i square and when do i multiply this is what we would like to know okay this is why it's called the square and multiply algorithm and not the square and something, square and Fourier transform algorithm. It's only square and multiply. So it's, very, it's a very simple idea is I have, at, the right, at the right moment in time I have to square and at the right moment of time I have to multiply. And how do we do that? I could give you the pseudocode, you look at the pseudocode, you have no idea what's going on. Okay? And I think there's a very nice way of explaining that Namely, this rule, when to square and multiply, depends on something extremely simple, namely, on the binary representation of the exponent, right? 26 is an, is an important number here, right? So now we look at the binary um, expansion. This is 1, 1, 0, 1, 0 in binary, right? Do you believe me? This is 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, right? 16 plus 8 is 24, plus 2 is 26, right? So this is a binary representation, okay? And now what I'm going to do with you now, and this is kind of the most important part of the lecture, not the, the second most important part of the lecture. I'm doing this stuff, and I'm looking at all the exponents in binary representation, and suddenly you see the light. I mean, this seems... Does this seem arbitrary, zufällig, willkürlich? I, I hope so, I hope so. Hope, say so yes. So, no, um, if I look at the binary representation, you will see an extremely simple rule. There's a very simple rule, but you can only see the rule if you look at the bits, not if you look at the 26, okay? So let's look at the rule. So goal is to generate this bit pattern. We start with x, and x is really x to the one, right? Is that clear? x is gleich x hoch 1. So what we do here, we square, the result is in binary, right? This is x square. Not that difficult. Okay. So. What? Yeah, okay. Now let, let, let's first look at the next step. So the next step is I multiply x which is x to the 1 by x to the 2. And now let's look here. It's a Zwischenrechnung. What is binary addition by hand? Okay. 0 and 1 is 1. This is 1. Okay. So now I give you a little bit of point, and I think that's quite important to get kind of a, a visual visual feeling, visuelles Gefühl for this. What I'm going to tell you, this, these two ones that we generated, they're going to end up these two ones here, okay? And uh, how, we'll, we'll, we'll just follow me, watch me. So the next thing is we square. Okay? Do, do you remember this rule here? alpha to the uh, what alpha to the a raised to the b power this double exponentiation what is that a times b right everybody with me this is ninth grade right not very complicated so that means squaring is multiplying the exponent by two okay this is not hard so but what happens if you have a binary representation you multiply that by two what happens Shift. It's the same if you have a decimal number, you multiply it by, by 10, right? 33 times 10 is 330, right? You shift it to the left, right? Yeah, to the left. So, okay, so, but what we mean by shifting to the left, what happens to the, to the right mode position, to the LSB? It becomes a zero, right? Okay. That means, First, very important step. Everybody awake here? 
multiplying is shifting the binary representation to the left, filling in a zero. Okay? Is that, is that right? Is that right? Yeah. This one, one, if you square, is shifted to the left by one position, you get a zero. Okay? This is the first atomic operation, the first thing you can do. The first of only two things. This is 50%. 50, halbe meter. Okay? It's here. What would happen if we keep squaring this? Which bit pattern would we get? We would get 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, right? Do we want that bit pattern? Uh, maybe. Not really, right? But what is good at this point is these three bits are these three bits we want to have here. Right? So we are fine with these three bits. So what we can do at this point, we square again. What happens? Well, again, it's a shift to the left-hand side by one bit position. OK, let's take a breath again. Are those four bits the bits we want to have here? Is this is four bits here? No, right? What is missing? What would we like to have here? What's failed here? What's, what, 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 yeah? We need a one at this point, right? And how do we do that? Well, this is the other, this is the other 50 percent. You multiply by x, and now again we have something that I showed here, which was easy. By multiplying with 1, you add a 1 at the LSB, at the least significant bit position. And those four bits that you generated by now, almost graphically, fast graphisch, are those four bits here. Okay. So what is the next thing we need? Well, we need another zero here. What do we do? How, how do we get the zero here? What is the next step? Square again. It's getting boring, right? And that's it. Okay, so we summarize. This is a square and multiply algorithm. That's our abbreviation, square and multiply, S-A-M, square and multiply algorithm. In words, so the first thing is scan, scannen sagt Ihnen was, ne? Generation X, ne? scan, ab, abfragen, abtasten, right? Scan the exponent bits left to right. That's what we did over there. You start on the left-hand side, okay, and you, you look at each exponent bit. Here are the rules. The rule is extremely simple. The two things we do per exponent bit, right? Per exponent bit, the two things we do. The first one is easy. In every iteration, jede iteration, in every iteration, we Square, and I use uppercase letters just to stress that. It means for every exponent bit, also jedes bit im exponenten, you definitely square. There no question asked. You square, square, square. Okay, this is not conditional. You always square. For every bit that you have here, you square once. Okay? So, and this worked actually nicely in this case here, right? 
square, 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 square. So, but apparently, as we saw by the example, sometimes you have to multiply. And what is the rule for multiplication? Whoever can answer that is perfect learning experience today. What is the rule? When do I multiply? What? Yeah. Again, we're scanning the bits, right? We're fragging the bits up. And there are only two possibilities, namely either a bit is zero, and then we don't do anything. It's easy. If it's one and only if it's one, we also multiply by x, by the original value. Second, if current bit, as if das aktuelle bit, if current bit is one, doppelpunkt, multiply by x. This is very graphic, blah, blah, blah. If you look in, in a more technical view is the pseudocode, pseudocode, which is actually on the book on page 182. So what you see in this box here, you know, I call the exponent h here for whatever reason. For Hochzahl, maybe, I, mean, I don't know. I think I ran out of variables here. So we want to compute this here. This, what you see here, which, which I tried to highlight, this actual pseudocode, is this rule, the simple rule, put into computer code. What I do here is t down to zero, and t, I don't know whether you see that this t comes up here. t is the bit length, okay? If t bits, you have to be a little bit careful. You ignore the highest bit, this bit ht. This is MSB, the höchstwertige bit. The highest value MSB bit is always one by, by convention, okay? So you start, in our case here, x to the 26. We really didn't start with the leftmost bit, but with the bit next to it. And the main rule is encoded here, 1.1 is, we always square, and then here's an if statement, we check the current bit, if this is equal to one, we also multiply by x. That's it. Very, very easy. Very, very easy rule. Okay. Um, we don't have to talk about security, we did that before briefly. Um, that's it for today. I would like you to fill the evaluation sheets and put them down here when you leave. Thank you very much.